see not much different. <laughs> Oh, right. I wish I could do better. <clears throat> yeah. So okay, we we'll, we'll we'll start. Oh, let's let's just talk. Let's yeah, just, let's just talk. Ask me ask me what you want to ask. Okay. Let's see where it takes. Where well, it takes. I, I want to greet you no matter what. First, Sam, thank you for being here, taking the time. I really appreciate. It. My pleasure, always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for referring to my work in your book. The end of mind of tomorrow. I, it's on my reading list. Actually, I was tempted. I started to read it. And I'm going to read it on my forthcoming trip to Romania. So, this is my reading material then. But thank you all the same for sending me a copy. Thank you so much. You were a big part of it. I can I cannot not send it to you. I'm actually <laughs> very um, excited. I would say also looking forward to talking with you. I'll explain why. In a sense, um, this book or everything I've been doing uh, lately it's to observe or we, we talk about it to see the world through including this book through the lenses of business technology psychology sociology and philosophy and uh, based That's on quite, the, a, quite a list quite a list um, there's a reason I kind of put this combination, it's not randomly. And um, based on my observation of you, and you are one of the few people, or I would even say probably the first person I came across that kind of touched on all of them uh, in, a, in a decent way, not just, you know, I know about them. You are, oh, I have it here, in case I forgot. <laughs> you are a writer, you are an author and you are a professor of psychology and you have a PhD in philosophy and physics. Correct me if I did my wrong research. And you also used to be in business and you also told me about that yourself, you're in economics and you know about technology. Plenty of your videos showed me that and you not just know on the surface, you know deep in roots how it affects the world, meaning the humans. Yeah. So, that's because I that's because I was Israel's uh, first venture capitalist. <laughs> so when I was much younger, I started the venture capital industry in Israel, which is now second in size to the United States. And I was also a stockbroker. Mm -hmm. So I learned about the nexus, the, the confluence between finance and technology. Right. And uh, so my background is is highly unusual because the first. Um, the first 20 years of my life I've been in I've been into physics and, and philosophy and I finished my doctorates. I was, I'm also a medical doctor so I finished medicine mm -hmm. but then I gave up on academia and I went to business and then within business I focused on commodity trading and then from commodity trading I branched out into finance and from finance to venture capital and technology and I'm talking like 50 years ago 40 years ago that's when it was not that popular <laughs> <laughs> and then the last 25 years I've, I've dedicated to psychology and uh, in between I was an economist and economic advisor to governments. Now, if you live as long as I have, you will also have nine or ten careers. <laughs> That's totally normal, don't be too impressed, it reflects my age. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being so humble. Um, I do know people also work their entire life on one occupation and also people like you i appreciate both of them and uh yeah thank you for sharing and now we know you uh quite a lot based on your professional background this is the question i ask almost all my guests now tell us about you as a person with three words meaning if you have to choose three words to describe yourself what are those words and why you chose them I am fiercely protective of the truth. I'm addicted to the truth. And I will make personal sacrifices. And unfortunately, I will sacrifice other people as well, their emotions, in order to propagate the truth. But I'm not sure that I'm doing it out of a moralistic judgment or a moral cognition. I think possibly there's a little sadism in that. <laughs> because the truth hurts and I know that the truth hurts because I'm a psychologist and yet I continue to wield it as a blunt instrument 
So I don't think I should be praised for that. <laughs> but that's the first. Mm -hmm. The second, second attribute is uh, um, fairness and, and justice. I'm very exercised when they are lacking. And the third is the, the surrealistic and supernatural belief in the ability to communicate information, truth, facts to people, despite all evidence to the contrary. And despite everything we know in psychology about cognitive biases and cognitive distortions, which tell us, which tells us that people are not open to uh, confront facts, to modify their opinions, to alter their behavior. People are not malleable. They're not flexible. They're very rigid, extremely rigid. And when the rigidity reaches a certain point, it's called personality disorder. Most people are on the verge of personality disorder. That's why it's very difficult. It's very difficult about everyone around me is a narcissist, which of course is not true. <laughs> but everyone around you could be narcissistic. Could have a narcissistic style, as Lynn Sperry calls it, narcissistic style. Because people are always on the verge of a personality disorder because they are very inflexible. They are not open. That's, these are my three traits, I think. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for open up for us. Oh, the fourth, the fourth is I like red, dry red wine. Red wine. Red wine. The mega pint. The mega pint. <laughs> That's a mega pint. It's definitely a mega pint. In terms of wine, it's a mega, 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 mega pint. <laughs> a mega pint. Thank you. Thank you. So now, ready for the questions? Always. Always. Are you ready for the answers? That's the question. <laughs> Always. <laughs> right. Then we make a, we make a budget there. Yeah. <laughs> so... Hear me out. So what's your understanding of the following terms, following words, and what is your understanding of the relationship among them? These are the words. Heart, mind, brain, intelligence, and consciousness. Five. Sorry if it's too long. I want to hear out your understanding of them and what do you consider the relationship among them? Intelligence is the capacity to observe connections mm -hmm. between ostensibly separate and disparate phenomena and objects. Mm -hmm. So it's what we call synoptic view. Intelligence is the ability to have a synoptic view. This, this, connect, this ability to connect generates insights. And insights allow you to reframe reality in a way that yields new information which you can then leverage to obtain favorable outcomes from the environment. In other words, intelligence renders you more self-efficacious. But what people fail to understand mm -hmm. is that intelligence is like electrical energy. It's a resource. Mm -hmm. It's like electricity. Mm -hmm. It's a utility. Mm -hmm. It can be used by the positive aspects of your personality, mm -hmm. or it can be abused by the negative aspects of your personality. It's neutral. It's value neutral. Not so the heart, what you call the heart. The heart is, of course, a pump, a very simple pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not what you meant, I assume. <laughs> but the heart, the seat of emotions, or the proverbial seat of emotions, the metaphorical seat of emotions, mm -hmm. is not value neutral. It does reflect underlying beliefs, values, mores, social and cultural uh, impositions like socialization, acculturation. It reflects personal history and so on. So it's a much more, much more varied thing than intelligence. The emphasis starting in the First World War, the emphasis on analytical intelligence as represented by IQ, mm -hmm. Reduced is a part of a general trend of reductionism in psychology, which culminated with behaviorism in the, in the 1960s, mm -hmm. where people were considered no different to rats in a laboratory, and still are to a large extent, because we presume to 
mit gesuchten Kontaktexperiments mm -hmm. um people. Mm -hmm. When actually you cannot conduct experiments on people because they are the type of subject matter who is affected by the experiment and also who changes from one day to the next. Consequently, we can replicate fewer than 10% of psychological experiments, which means there is a replication or replicability crisis in psychology. The heart is the core. It's very complex and it's intimately connected to cognitions. Nowadays, we consider emotions to be a type of cognition. When cognition is coupled with sensor, with sensory input, that's what we call emotion. Emotion is reactive, exactly like many cognitions. It's a subspecies of cognition. So the mind and the heart are two sides, two flip sides of the same coin, not as we used to think. There are two flip sides of the same coin. We know, for example, that if we have a thought, mm -hmm. it can induce an emotion. Mm -hmm. And if we have an emotion, it often causes us to think in certain ways. Mm -hmm. They are intimately connected. Mm -hmm. So there's the mind, the heart, intelligence. The brain is a very difficult issue. <laughs> yes, it seems to be the simplest. But actually, it is very controversial. You see, we have this presupposition mm -hmm. that the brain is the seat of identity and the seat of the mind. This is highly contentious both in psychology and in medicine and physiology. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Most of the hormones that regulate mood are not produced in the brain. They are produced in the intestines. Serotonin, for example, is produced 91% in the intestines, mm -hmm. not in the brain. Another example is that the connection between the brain and the spine is not clear. We know, for example, that spinal fluid at night when you sleep mm -hmm. cruises through the brain and cleanses it, cleans it. It's like a cleaning crew in a, in a high rise, you know, at night. And yet we don't know why does this fluid come from the spine and where does it go afterwards or what does it do afterwards with the allegedly the dark, <laughs> the we also have no idea about most functions of the brain. We have no idea what is sleep, what is dreaming. We don't. Know, we know very little about the brain, and yet with hubris, <laughs> yes. the glorious hubris, we claim that we know everything there is, or almost everything there is to know, and we even administer drugs or medications that affect this very sensitive organ without knowing what the hell we're doing. It's a very dangerous game, not on the philosophical level. Correlation is not causation. We can establish correlations between mental events and physiological events, biochemical events, electrobiochemical events. We can establish this connection. And this connection is very regular, like the rising of the sun in the morning. But we have no idea if the mental events cause the physiological events or vice versa. They are correlated, but we have no idea about the causation. For example, the brains of psychopaths are very different to the brains of normal people. In terms of gray matter, white matter, the striatus, the amygdala, most regions of the brain are very different, and the functioning of the brain is very different. Yet, was this caused by the emergence of psychopathy in early childhood, because psychopathy starts in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Was this called, because the brain is forming and sh being shaped in early childhood. Right. Was the psychopathy the cause of these, these malfunctions or abnormalities? Or was the abnormality already present at birth? We don't have an answer to this. We don't know what causes what. And so, I would be very careful about the brain. Extremely careful. I am of the mind, and mind you, this is only speculation, mm -hmm. so substantiated. I am of the mind that the distinction between the brain and the rest of the body mm -hmm. is both artificial and counterfactual. I think if evolution and nature act in rational 
Darwin wins. Mm -hmm. They adhere to scientific reasoning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Processing would be distributed, not centered in one organ. I think most of our mental functions are distributed throughout the body. And I think the focus on the brain as the exclusive seat of mental life, including cognition, emotion, analysis, you name it, mm -hmm. has led us astray because we have neglected the rest of the body. I fully believe that there is what used to be called distributed parallel processing. In other words, what we call today connectionism. I believe the whole human body right. is one giant laboratory of mental life. Now we know it's partly true because, for example, when we amputate people, mm -hmm. there is phantom limb, phantom limb syndrome, where the, the person continues to feel the missing limb long after the missing limb is gone. It seems that there is some kind of processing going on at the local level. <laughs> we know that the, the gastrointestinal system has a mind of its own. In essence, a second brain. We know that many areas of the body are not connected to the brain. And yet, they continue to function perfectly. We know there's a lot of information mm. that doesn't reach the brain at all mm -hmm. from parts of the body, big parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And finally, we know that the brain consciously registers less than 5% of the information it receives. Less than 5%. Right. And what the, brain, what the brain does, it generates on the fly models, simulations of reality. When you're listening to me, when you're looking at me, luckily for you, you observe only or absorb only 5%. What, you, what you're doing, yeah. you, you, you create in your mind an image and a simulation of Sambhakni. Mm -hmm. And when you're listening to me, because you listen only to 5% of what I'm saying, you're filling in the blanks. There's a, a series of heuristic extra, 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 extrapolations mm -hmm. in the brain, mathematical models. Everything is happening in your mind, not outside. And I refuse to believe that all this is taking place only in your brain, because if we were to meet face to face, mm -hmm. I would have an impact on multiple organs of you, not only on your brain, even if I don't touch you. For example, I would immediately exchange with you a molecule which contains 100 items of information about my genetic and immune system. And that is totally unconscious, non-deliberative. So... Vice versa? I, I will also Sorry? send you uh, my, 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 my molecules from my body to yours. Is it is this an interactive process from both? Yes, you are sending a molecule, I'm sending a molecule. Whenever people meet, they exchange this molecule. All people, in all settings. But you see, people affect each other at a distance. For example, the, some fields of the brain extend up to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. Another example, when a woman passes next to a man, mm -hmm. and by the way, doesn't matter how she looks, and doesn't matter how old she is, shockingly, when any woman passes next to any man, regardless of age, looks, or whatever, mm -hmm. the level of testosterone production in the man increases by 40%, for zero. She just has to pass, not to talk, not to look, not to interact in any way, just to pass. We are regulated by our environment all the time. In certain personality disorders, the regulation extends even to the most basic and minimal functions, mm -hmm. like reality, perception of reality, a sense of self-worth. And then we say that these people are disordered because their, their external regulation is too much, but what we don't realize Yes. We are 99% regulated by the environment. That's why I am utterly against the counterfactual concepts of mm -hmm. self, individual, mm -hmm. personality. Mm -hmm. I think these are nonsensical concepts that came from Germany and Austria mm -hmm. in, at the end of the 19th century when these were authoritarian societies with a unitary structure of government 
and a unitary structure in the family. So they established a hierarchy in psychology. The psychology that we are studying today, and that we are teaching today, is a 19th century German authoritarian thinking. And so there is a self. And the self is like the pater familias, is the father of family, is like the Kaiser, you know, is like the Führer, yes. the self. He is the leader, he is the, it's a German thing. Yes. It simply reflects cultural mores and perceptions and a civilization that's no longer with us. Today, we live in a network society, a distributed society. Mm -hmm. We must rewrite. I am proposing to rewrite psychology from scratch, getting rid of antiquated concepts like self and individual, mm -hmm. and replacing them mm -hmm. with self-assembling networks of self-states. Mm -hmm. Much more fluid um, approach. So we have to rewrite. Does that mean human changed or or the previous understanding was limited? How to approach this? Everything, everything we do in science, mm -hmm. we're known that everything we do in science is uh, affected by our culture, cultural context, our society, mm -hmm. beliefs, we, the beliefs and values we hold. Mm -hmm. The people who created psychology were Germans. Mm -hmm. Wund, Wund, Freud, Mm -hmm. was in Austria, mm -hmm. a German sphere. This was, these were authoritarian societies with a unitary center of control, mm -hmm. with rigid, hierarchical social structures. So they created a description so they of human mind that, that looked the same. So it, it was, was a German. limited version of psychology. It's a limited it's, version. It's a culture, what they call culture bound. It's a culture dependent mm -hmm. version of psychology. And by rewriting, what do you mean? We need to fit into the mass humanity, not just based on one culture. We know that people are not unitary. Mm -hmm. They are not fixed. Mm -hmm. They flow. Yeah. People, a, a human being is a river. Yeah. Not a, not a lake, not a pond. It's a river. Mm. It's like Heraclitus said. Pantare, everything, everything flows. You can't enter the same river twice. There's no such thing as self. At any, at any moment, in reaction to other people, in reaction to environmental cues, mm -hmm. we tend to become different people. So You're not the same as... What's the word right of psychology, if I may ask? What's the role of psychology? Sounds like psychology. there's no pattern. There's no way to trace... We can't no, 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 you can, you can make an inventory, you can make an inventory of your self-states. If I were to observe you long enough, to your detriment, <laughs> I, would, I, would be, I would be able to map out, to com compile an inventory of your self-states. Uh -huh. uh, so I would know that you have, I don't know, eight or nine self-states, mm -hmm. and that when you are subject to humiliation, rejection, and abandonment, your self-state is psychopathic. Which is the case? Which is the case in borderline personality disorder? No. <laughs> they become secondary psychopaths when they are rejected, abandoned, and humiliated. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to, to make a map of you, a map. Got it. But, but to say that you are one mm -hmm. in all conditions, mm -hmm. in all environments, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. all people, all the time, and you will remain this way to the end of your days. Yeah. That is rank nonsense. It flies in the face of everything we know about human beings. But we don't dare. We don't dare confront this lie at the core of psychology. Still? First of all, yes. Still? First of all, mm -hmm. many people make a lot of money from this. Okay, yes. They are best, yes. huge, yes. best yes. interested. They are the coaches. Mm -hmm. they are coaches, psychologists, therapists, everyone makes a lot of money from this. It's an industry. Before I forget. What do you, what's your understanding of consciousness? Anything. Just your... There are some, there are some problems mm -hmm. that are unresolvable, that will never have, a, have an answer in principle. Never mind how much you know, never mind how much you work. About consciousness. Same. Consciousness is like God. These are concepts that are meaningless in the sense that you cannot assign meaning to them. For example, you cannot say true or false. Mm -hmm. They are meaningless. Consciousness, I 
prepare you and define you to define consciousness. God, there is no procedure I can think of that can determine if God exists or not. Similarly, there is no procedure I can think of that can help us define consciousness. We don't, not only we don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but we can never in principle know what it is. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that we are both the raw material, the subject, and the object. We are both observers, right. and we, we, we are observing us. This creates effectively an infinite regression, because you are observing mm -hmm. who? You are observing the observer. And the observer is observing you, observing the observer. And there's no end to this. This is the cycle, never ending. Mm -hmm. It's an infinite regression. There's no, there's no end to this. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to define consciousness, you engage in a process called introspection. Yes. You look, you look inside, you, look, you observe yourself. Right. But some, someone must make this, someone must do this observation. Who is doing it? Who's the one? Well, who's the one who is observing? Well, another consciousness. Only a conscious entity can observe. So if you're observing your own consciousness, there must be a meta-consciousness, another consciousness, observing this consciousness. And of course, it's infinite. Yeah, there's no that's the rapid hole, right? It never ends. Yes, there's no, yes, there's no way to define consciousness. Now, we do know, of course, mm -hmm that we feel something. For example, we feel that we exist. Right. But even that is, even that is contestable. For example, how do I know that you're human? How do I know that when you tell me that you're feeling sad, you are feeling sad? And how do I know that what you define as sadness is my sadness? Mm -hmm. In other words, we have a problem to access other people's minds. We have to rely on self-reporting. Other people report, and we have to rely on the veracity and the accuracy of these reports, mm -hmm. which is extremely bad science. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, the only mind we know for sure we have access to yeah. is ours. We have no access to any other mind, and therefore, we cannot know anything about any other mind, period. The assumption that you and I have anything whatsoever in common mm -hmm. is fallacious. End of story. Because you can't prove it. And you can't falsify it. It's not subject to scientific, to the scientific method. Prove. Scientific. Can I ask what's your understanding of science and what's your understanding of spirituality? And how do you consider the relationship between the two? How do you define them? Science is a method. Yeah. To a method to establish a possible way to get closer to the truth without ever attaining it. Without ever it, attaining it. <laughs> without ever attaining it. Uh huh. It's a method of organizing observations in a way that we yield predictions that we can then falsify. Right. If these predictions cannot be falsified, it's not science. Science, therefore, relies crucially on the ability to be wrong. Science is not about being right, it's about being wrong. That's not me, that's Karl Popper. So, science creates theories and then all the scientists, once there's a new theory, all the scientists are trying to destroy it, trying to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, scientists have been trying to prove Einstein wrong for 100 years. Everyone is trying to prove Einstein. People were trying to prove Einstein wrong within a few years from the publication of relativity theory. They were measuring light around the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. This is what science is about. Proving, proving theory is wrong. To get the, belief to the truth. <laughs> The belief it is, exactly, the belief is that is we eliminate what is wrong. Exactly like Sherlock Holmes said. Sherlock Holmes said, if you eliminate what is improbable, whatever remains, however, un, however unlikely, must be the truth. So, science is the same. Science is eliminated. And, and then, by process of elimination, 
in science belief that it's getting closer to the truth. But science is a religion. It's a belief system. Science believes in the scientific method. Science believes in falsifiability. Science believes that believe scientists believe that observations have value and are somehow connected to reality and not, for example, to the human mind. Because I can construct a case easily that everything we see is not real, but a simulation. <laughs> easily. David Chalmers, the famous philosopher, yeah. even thinks this is the case. <laughs> so, but there's a series of beliefs that underlie science, and in this sense, it's a religion. It's a faith-based system. Spirituality is the kind of thing that I avoid because it's indefinable, exactly like consciousness and God. I don't think anyone agrees on what is spiritual. Any two people agree on what is spirituality. I think spirituality is the feeling of transcendence, the feeling that there is something beyond you and beyond the world which you cannot be captured with reason. So spirituality is anything mm -hmm. that cannot be captured with reason. But with, for example, belief, mm -hmm. faith, the faith in God, for example. And so, and so we have two, two competing systems. Yeah. One system uses reason yes. to get closer to an alleged ostensible truth, which maybe doesn't exist at all. The very concept of truth is very contentious. Mm -hmm. And the other system is based on a leap of faith, as Kierkegaard called it. It's, it's, it's based on the belief, the belief that you can glean knowledge, even if it's only your knowledge, idiosyncratic, cannot be communicated. For example, in a mystical, in a mystical experience, yes? you can glean knowledge, not using this, using other means, many other means, even mushrooms. <laughs> but you can glean knowledge, not using this. So these are two, these two are in competition. And yes, they are mutually exclusive. Anyone who tells you that religion and science are compatible or that is, has no idea what is religion, has no idea what is science. S science is not compatible re with religion because it's the religion of reason. And all other, all other doctrines and ways of thought and schools, they are not based on reason, while science is. Additionally, science uses a language, a highly specific language, called mathematics. Mm -hmm. But mathematics can be used and abused in spiritual disciplines. For example, in astrology, there's a lot of mathematics. I so that's not, a, that's not a distinguishing picture. So there's no way these two can be compatible or merged in whatsoever oh. sense. Never, ever. Yeah. Anyone who claims otherwise has no idea what he's talking about. And I heard, I heard a very interesting thing. I heard that uh, mathematics uh, people they, they have the highest chance to get the uh, mental disorder. Is that true? I'm not aware of this correlation. I may have missed some studies, but I'm not aware of this correlation. Although there were very famous mathematicians like Nash, mm -hmm. who, was who was a schizophrenic, mm -hmm. but there were mentally ill people in many other disciplines, so I'm not sure there's a necessary connection. Mathematics, mathematics is a language. Mm -hmm. It's the rudiments of language. It's a language reduced to its base elements. Mm -hmm. It is extremely surprising, for example, why mathematics describes reality so efficiently. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. No one can give you an answer to this. Mm -hmm. But it's a core, core problem in philosophy and in, in, uh, in for example, physics. Yeah. Why is mathematics so efficient? We don't know. Why is logic so efficient? And logic is a, is, a, is a forerunner of arithmetic. And so why these languages, let's call them formal languages, mm -hmm. why formal languages are so efficient when the world is not formal? Right. The world is fuzzy. Right. The world is fuzzy. The world is crazy. The world is chaotic. Yeah. The world blends and moves. The world is more like smoke. And yet, a highly rigid formal <laughs> set of languages captures the world perfectly how is this possible we don't know the answer and it's a huge huge argument in in philosophy and, yeah. and, and science 
yeah, this underlying cold that <coughs> seems running running this chaotic world. Um, so Carl Gustav John said in his 1959 interview, and he said, the only real danger that exists is man himself, and we are pitifully unknown of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. That's from 1959. Now, do you agree with him? Or anything changed, for better or for worse? Nothing much changed, no. As far as the quiddity, the essence of what it is to be a human, what is, what is the human experience, mm -hmm. I don't think much has changed for the very simple reason that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You cannot really communicate it. No one has access to another mind, and many, many experiences are so idiosyncratic, so individual, that you cannot communicate these experiences. For example, if right now, because you're exposed to me, you would have a mystical experience, <laughs> you would not be able to communicate it to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many words you will use. Mm -hmm. So this will remain forever trapped in your mind, never get out. So. The essence of, of what it is to be a human is still remains a mystery and will remain a mystery forever because of this barrier in communication. We have a concept in philosophy called intersubjectivity. It is the belief that people somehow, based on similarities and based on a contract, an agreement, can somehow develop empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. And intersubjectivity is highly dubious. Highly dubious <laughs> to you as a British understatement. So I don't think I think each one of us is a, is solipsistic as an island. Yeah. And I don't think there are any bridges between these islands and no cruise ships going between these islands. Mm -hmm. They're totally islands. Mm -hmm. We are, however, as islands do, mm -hmm. we are embedded in an ocean. Mm -hmm. And the ocean is this collective what we can call mankind or humanity, there are dynamics which characterize masses of people. Many of these dynamics are negative. For example, the Nazi party or Trump supporters in, on January 6th. So many collective dynamics are very negative, mob, mob dynamics, crowd dynamics. But many of these dynamics are conducive to survival. Mm -hmm. And they do elevate us beyond the confines of the limits of a single human body. So this is the ocean in which all the islands are embedded 